This is a fi Facebook Live event run by Contact. My name is Derek Sinclair. I am uh, one of the benefits advisors on Contact's helpline and I work as part of the family finance team. The idea behind today's session really is to give you an opportunity as parents to ask any questions that you have about the very complicated rules that apply to young people trying to claim universal credit if they're still in education. Um, so the idea is that you'll be able to post questions and I'll try and answer them uh, live during this session. If you are posting questions, it would be quite useful uh, if you could let me know the age of the child and also the type of um, a co uh, education that they're in. So whether they're in advanced education, like a university type course, or whether they're in non-advanced education at school or college or a life skills course. Um, just before I jump into answering the questions, I think I should maybe just set the scene slightly just by explaining what the rules actually say about claims uh, for universal credit while someone's in education. And I think we need to be clear that the sort of default, the sort of general rule is that you, most students can't claim universal credit uh, while they're still in education. Um, and the, the regulations basically specifically say, and there's a regulation 12 that says you can't claim universal credit if you're receiving education. But I think what we need to do is envisage that phrase, receiving education in inverted commas, because it doesn't necessarily apply to every student on every type of course. The regulation actually specifically sets out who will be caught by this rule and refused universal credit. So which students are going to automatically be refused? Well, first of all, if you're in full-time advanced education, then you're definitely going to be treated as receiving education. And also, if you're on a course of any other type where you could get a maintenance grant or a maintenance loan, you're also going to be treated as receiving education. So people in university type courses, they tend to be caught by this rule. Also, if a young person's in full-time non-advanced education, um, they too will also be treated as receiving education and refused universal credit automatically, but only if they're aged between 16 and the August after their 19th birthday. So these two groups, people in full-time advanced education and younger disabled people who are between 16 and the August after their 19th birthday and who are in non-advanced education, the chances are that if they try and claim universal credit, they're going to be refused on the basis they're receiving education. And the only way that they're realistically going to be able to get universal credit in those two scenarios is if they're in group a group which is exempt from the restrictions on students. So there are certain very limited groups um, students who have kids of their own, for example, uh, certain students who are estranged from their parents, but there's also a group of disabled students who are exempt. But the problem is how tightly these rules are drawn, because in order to be exempt from the restrictions as a disabled student, you not only have to be disabled, you also have to be getting DLA or PIP. But in addition to that, you have to be someone who's established, you have a limited capability for work, which means you've went through a DWP medical assessment. And not only that, but you have to have went through that medical assessment before you started your current course of education. So it's quite difficult. You know, a lot of disabled students won't meet those tests, which is one of the reasons that so many families have difficulties in claiming. Um, but what about those young people who are perhaps a little bit older and still in full-time non-advanced education. So if you're, say, if you've reached the September after your 19th birthday or went beyond that, if you're 20 and you're still at school or college or in some life skills course, for example, what about that group of students? Well, actually, there should be a lot more flexibility for them to receive universal credit. Unlike younger students or students in advanced education, they're not automatically going to be treated as receiving education. The only way they can be lawfully refused universal credit as a student is if the Department of Work and Pensions believe that there's a conflict between their course 
and any work-related conditions that have been attached to their universal credit claim. So when people claim universal credit, there's often conditions attached to their claim. Uh, for some people, that might be to look for work. For some people, it might be to take part in training or certain other activities to get them work ready. And if the DWP believe that you couldn't meet those conditions, those tra you know, if you've been expected to take part in a training course, that you wouldn't be able to get the time off your course to do that, then they'll argue that there's a conflict between the course and the claim and you should be refused universal credit. But not everyone has conditions. Sometimes the DWP will look at a disabled student and they'll decide that the most appropriate thing to do is to switch off any conditions temporarily pending a medical assessment. And if there are no conditions attached to your claim, then there cannot be a conflict between your course and your claim. And therefore, if you're a 20-year-old who's in, still in non-advanced education and you're in that situation, you should be able to get universal credit as normal. And similarly, even if there are some restriction, uh, sorry, some work-related uh, conditions attached to your claim, if they're quite minor, it may be that your course is flexible enough to allow you to take the time off to do those activities. For example, if someone's on a life skills course, the course might be delighted for your son or daughter to take some time out to go to the job centre and take part in some activities that would get them maybe more work ready. So the DWP shouldn't just assume that there's a conflict between the course and the conditions. They would need to speak to the education provider to find out whether they can accommodate those um, work-related conditions or not. And if they can accommodate it, then again, there should be no conflict between the course and the claim and therefore it should be feasible uh, for a young person in that situation who's passed the September after their 19th birthday, still in school, college or some other form of non-advanced education, they should still be able to claim universal credit. Although in a lot of cases they are wrongly being refused just automatically. I think we see a lot of problems where rather than applying the law, the DWP just have a knee-jerk reaction which is if you're in education of any type, and no matter what your age, then you're going to be refused universal credit. And you know those kind of decisions are, are unlawful, really, and should be able to be overturned. Okay, so I'm just going to have a quick look and see what sort of questions uh, we've had come in from um, parents. So someone uh, is asking whether they're saying that their daughter gets employment and support allowance and will this continue? So um, employment and support allowance is a benefit. Um, so it's it's got two types of payment. There's a contributory ESA, which is called New Style ESA, which is only payable to people who have worked in the past and paid national insurance. There used to also be something called income related ESA. Um, income related ESA uh, was a means tested benefit for young disabled people. Um, it was replaced by universal credit. But if you do have someone who is, uh, you know, claimed in the past before universal credit came in and has been in receipt of ESA, then yeah, that should continue in uh, education. The rules around ESA were much more uh, flexible. Uh, under the old rules, you only needed to show that your child was in receipt of DLA or PIP. That was the only uh, thing you needed to show for them to be allowed to continue claiming benefit while in education. Uh, it's only when they've introduced universal credit that they've uh, made it significantly more difficult for students with disabilities to claim uh, while they've still been on a course. Uh, someone's also asked, what does advanced education mean? Well, advanced education really means uh, education that's equivalent to sort of university uh, type courses. Uh, NVQ level four or above um, would be classed as advanced. All university courses are advanced. Um, HMRC who deal with child benefit, um, they actually have a list on their the .gov.uk website which sets out what sort of common courses are either advanced or non-advanced. Um, so a parent's 
uh, given an example of some of the difficulties that arise. They're saying um, their daughter is 19 um, and has had to, unfortunately, has had to leave education, uh, further education, in order to claim universal credit. Um, I'm not sure there whether... So that in that case, um, if it's non-advanced education that the young person is um, in, if they're past the August after their 19th birthday and in non-advanced education, then they should really potentially have been able to continue claiming universal credit. Um, as I say, what often happens is that there is a major problem with um, the DWP just having a knee-jerk reaction, which is, oh, your son or daughter's on a course? Well, they're going to be refused universal credit because they're a student. But that's not what the legal test is. What they have to look at is whether you fall under Regulation 12 of the Universal Credit Regulations. And it basically says that you are receiving education if you are in, in full-time advanced education, if you are on a course where a, a maintenance grant or loan can be paid, or if you're in non-advanced education and haven't yet reached the August after your 19th birthday. So if none of those three things apply to you, you shouldn't be refused universal credit unless there is this conflict between your course and your claim. So that may be a case um, where the young person has been wrongly refused universal credit. It would, what we would need to look at in a case like that is what conditions were applied to the claim, if any, and if so, whether they were you know, correctly, sort of reasonably done, and also whether the DWP then had any contact with the educational provider to see whether whatever conditions that were attached, whether they could have been accommodated by the course or not. Um, so there would have been scope in a case like that potentially to challenge the decision. And um, I would you know, um, encourage any parents in that sort of situation to phone our helpline for further advice. Um, Um, so someone's asked whether a part-time open u university degree course excludes someone from universal credit. Um, if it's a part-time course, then they're not automatically excluded. So the automatic exclusions apply to people in full-time advanced education. An open university degree course is definitely an advanced course, but it's not full-time in this case. So they're not in full-time uh, advanced education so they're not automatically going to be refused what should happen in the case like that is it comes back to this question of whether they're on a uh, uh, whether their their attendance on their course is in conflict with any work related um, conditions that have been attached to the claim so um, as I said earlier I mean it's very difficult to sort of predict in advance what conditions, if any, will be attached to a young person's universal credit claim. Uh, shortly after you make a claim for universal credit, there's normally an appointment um, set up um, with um, staff at the job centre where they will essentially um, try and draft up something called a claimant commitment, which is an agreement between the claimant or the appointee asking on their behalf and the DWP about what uh, conditions will need to be met as part of getting paid universal credit. Uh, everyone will have a claimant commitment, even if you're somebody who's not expected to look for work and, or training, at the very least you'll have to commit yourself to keeping them informed about changes of circumstances. But beyond that, there's a lot of discretion that the work coaches have about what can what other conditions they're going to apply to the claim. So some people will be expected to look for work as a condition of claiming universal credit if they're, you know, uh, say a non-disabled person who's trying to claim. 
uh, even if you have disabilities, though, you might still have some conditions attached. You might be expected to look for some limited amounts of work, or you might not be able be expected to look for work, but you might be expected to look for training or take part in some other sort of activities. But sometimes the DWP staff will decide, you know what, in, in, in light of the person's disabilities, uh, in light of the challenges that would be in supporting them into training and stuff, we are going to just switch off the conditions um, and we're not going to ask you to do anything pending this medical assessment that's going to take part, that's going to happen as part of the universal credit claim. Now, if they do that, if they decide to use their discretion to switch off um, any conditions, then there cannot be a conflict between the course and the claim if the claim has no conditions attached. So, you know, in those sort of situations, it may well be possible uh, for someone who's in part-time advanced education to still receive universal credit if the job centre staff either agree not to attach conditions or attach very minor conditions to the claim. Uh, the problem with this is if you are somebody, uh, you know, who either thinks you're going to be in part-time education or are going to be staying on in non-advanced education beyond the September after your 19th birthday, it's, it's, a, it's a not a very nice situation to be in where you don't know whether you'll get universal credit or not because it's all going to be down to the discretion of your work coach. It'd be much better to have certainty about whether you'd be able to claim universal credit at that later date or not. So ideally what you want to have happen is for a medical to take place at an early point for your son or daughter to go through a, a medical to prove that they're not fit to work or take part in training. Because if you can do that, then it means that at a later date, if you try and claim universal credit, if you've established already in advance that you're not fit for work or training, then it's not at the discretion of the DWP staff anymore. You have an absolute right um, to claim universal credit in those circumstances because somebody who's went through a work capability assessment and shown that they have a limited capability for work and work-related activity, by law, they cannot have any conditions attached to their claim. So um, if you can get a medical done early, then that then gives you the certainty that if your child ends up in a part-time advanced ed course, uh, part, sorry, a part-time course, or if there's someone who stays on in full-time non-advanced education longer term, you know, when they're 20 or whatever, you know it's, that you'll, they will be guaranteed being able to claim universal credit in that scenario because the DWP will not be allowed to put any work-related conditions on their claim. And that's one of the reasons that we are quite, you know, recommending that parents, generally speaking, that you try and get a, a, a work capability assessment medical done uh, for your son or, or daughter, you know, once they're 16, even though it might not help them now, it will potentially help them at a later date and make it much more likely that they'll be able to claim universal credit if they're in one of those two scenarios. If there's somebody who's in part-time education or there's someone who stay in full-time non-advanced education beyond the August after their 19th birthday, or indeed if there's somebody who moves course, who changes their course, because if they've went through a medical before they start their new course, it means they'll be in one of the exempt groups. They'll be a disabled person who's on DLA or PIP, who's got a limited capability for work and who's established that limited capability before they started their course. So yeah, we, we think it's a very good idea to try and get a medical done if at all possible. Okay, I'm just looking here at um, parents' uh, circumstances. So they've got a child who finished school in August 22, 16, started college in September on a non-advanced course at a new college, applied for ESA in July, asked for it to be backdated, assessed in November, his award 
So he went, in this case, the young person has went through a medical in November. They've established a limited capability for work and work-related activity. Uh, all right. Sorry, I just lost the page. Oh, sorry, um, appear to have lost that person's query. I'll come back to that as I go through them. Um, the order keeps jumping. Um, so uh, a parent's asked whether um, parents need to have financial powers over a child that can't manage their own money. Uh, you, you don't need to have like a power of attorney or a deputyship. You just need to be granted uh, an appointeeship, which is something that really should be set up when they turn 16, uh, when your child um, sort of moves from DLA to PIP, at that point um, you'll be asked um, whether or not uh, your child requires someone to help them manage their benefits, whether they have the capacity mentally to do that themselves, and if they can't, you'll be made their appointee, and as an appointee you have the right to claim any state benefits uh, on their behalf. Um, So um, my daughter is aged 18. She has the highest rates of personal independence payment in a specialist college. Life skills course was never told about LTW. Should I apply for universal credit and when? <clears throat> OK, so, um, so your daughter's 18. She's in. Uh, Eighteen in a non-advanced education, so um, you won't be able to receive universal credit for the child at the moment because um, at the moment they are someone who will definitely be treated as receiving education. Um, they are somebody who's in full-time non-advanced education who's and who's aged between sixteen and the August after their nineteenth birthday. So if you were to make a claim for universal credit for, for them, um, just now they're definitely going to be refused unless they're in one of the exempt groups. To be exempt as a disabled student, they would have had to have went through a medical and established a limited capability for work before they started the course. So at the, the moment, I'm afraid, if a medical has not already been done in the past, I'm afraid your child is going to be refused. They're going to be someone who's treated as receiving education. But what we would what we would recommend that you do is that you start this process of trying to get a claim for uh, get a medical assessment um, carried out. It's the process involves you having to make something called a credits only claim for new style ESA. <clears throat> So um, your, com your son or daughter is basically completing an application form for a benefit that they don't have any chance of receiving. A new style ESA is a benefit for people who are, have worked in the past and paid national insurance. And I'm assuming that your son or daughter, sorry, your daughter in this case, hasn't done that. So she'll be f filling in an application or you'll be doing this on her behalf for a benefit that you know she won't qualify for. You will get a decision back shortly after you've made the claim saying that she'd been refused new style ESA. But what should happen behind the scenes is that your child um, should have a medical assessment organised. So although they refused the benefit, the Department of Work and Pension still have a legal duty to carry out a medical assessment to see whether um, they have a limited capability for work or not. And one of the reasons they have a legal duty to do that is because your child's not working, they're not paying any national insurance, and that means that there is a gap in their national insurance record. Um, so the, the law says that if they can show that the reason they're not working and paying national insurance is because of their health problems, then they can 
um, receive these national insurance credits from the government. So you've got a legal right to have an assessment done to protect your national insurance record. But the other thing that happens is once this medical is done and it's found that you've got a limited capability for work, not only does it protect your national insurance record, but it also means that in the future, if you try and claim universal credit at a later date, you will already have established this incapacity for work and training, which means that when your daughter reaches the, August, the September after her 19th birthday, at that point, she should then be able to claim universal credit because she's not falling into any of the groups of students who are caught by the rules. She's not in advanced education. She doesn't get a maintenance grant or loan. Although she's in non-advanced education still, she's not in the age group that's caught because she's not aged between 16 and the August after her 19th birthday. And there's no conflict between her course and her claim because there cannot be any conditions attached to her claim if she's already established that she's unfit to work. Uh, so another parent's asking, um, my daughter will be 20 in September. We have started the credits only ESA and we're presuming we will next do the capability for work assessment next. She wants to carry on in college next September, maybe a level two course or some time of work experience. Will she be able to claim universal credit? Sorry, um, for some reason, I just lost the comment there. I'm really sorry about this, but the um, comments keep on moving, so I'm losing um, uh, the thread of the com the call the questions that are coming up. R really sorry for this. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to the, the next comment that I can see. Um, so someone here saying their son is 17 and on a full time course, still under a tax credits. Is it worth changing him over to universal credit now? Well. If he's in full-time non-advanced education, <clears throat> then um, he's someone who's going to be treated as receiving education. So even if you wanted to, you wouldn't be able to get universal credit for him just now. So yes, you would continue to claim child benefit and tax credits for him in the interim. Um, as I said earlier, I would recommend you get a, a work capability assessment done uh, now um, so that if he still ends up being in full-time non-advanced education when he turns 20, then at that point he should be able to get universal credit without any problems because if he's went through the medical and shown he's unfit for work and training, they won't be able to argue that they should apply any conditions to his claim and if there's no conditions, there's no conflict between the course and the claim and therefore he should be entitled to claim universal credit from the uh, August after his 19th birthday um, onwards. Um, someone's asking a, a question about national insurance credits, saying does anyone get them automatically, for example, do any students automatically get them? Well, the answer is no. Uh, anyone who, who's studying, who's not working, who's not signing on, who's not um, uh, you know, involved economically in that kind of way, is not going to be getting national insurance credits unless they submit fit notes from their doctor and make claim for new style ESA, or what's called a credits only claim. So you're claiming new style ESA in the knowledge that you won't receive the benefit itself, but simply in order to force a medical assessment to happen. 
uh, and that medical assessment has two benefits. One, if, if so if assuming that the young person is found unfit to work, one, it will protect their national insurance record, but secondly, it will help them claim universal credit in the future if they fall into one or two categories. Either there's someone who moves course or there's someone who stay on in non-advanced education beyond the August after their 19th birthday. So someone here saying they'd applied for a new style ESA for their daughter, um, but because they have an ongoing award of PIP at the enhanced for both, they did not require an assessment. Does this mean that when she turns 18 in May, she will be entitled to universal credit? Um, no, no, and they, they, I would be very worried if they haven't carried out uh, an assessment of your child. Um, you know, in order for her to potentially be able to claim um, universal credit at a later date, and I don't think she's going to get it when she turns 18, you know, um, essentially, f f in order for your child to maximise your child's chances of getting universal credit at a later date, either if she moves course or if she stays on in full-time non-advanced education longer term, you need to try and get a medical assessment done. Having a, an award of PIP is not enough in itself. So I think you need to go back to uh, the, the, the team that we're dealing with the ESA claim and you know argue that she's got a legal right to have the medical assessment done um, under um, a piece of legislation from the 1970s called the Social Security Credits Regulations. Anyone who is unfit to work, who has a limited capability for work and who provides medical certificates from their GP, they have a legal right to have their capacity for work assessed in order to protect their national insurance record. And they can't refuse to do so, although they often commonly do refuse for various reasons. They shouldn't be refusing. It's a legal right that your daughter has. And you want to try and ensure that that assessment's done. Uh, it won't help them in the here or now. You're, it won't make it any more likely that your child will get universal credit at this point in time, but it might make all the difference uh, about them being able to claim universal credit at a later date. So if your child moves course, if she can argue, well, at the time she starts her new course, that she's already been through a medical and established she's got a limited capability for work, then she can argue that she's exempt from the restrictions on students. Or if she's someone that stays on in a course of full-time non-advanced education, once she reaches the, the September after her 19th birthday, having this decision saying that she's got a limited capability for work will mean that she's able to claim universal credit as a right rather than having to be reliant on the discretion of uh, work coaches at the job centre. So yeah, someone here is saying their daughter is turning 16, expect her to stay on in a special school. Um, they understand that she won't be able to claim universal credit, um, but are you saying that I should apply for a credits only claim for new style ESA in order to trigger a work capability assessment? Um, yeah, so it, that's exactly what we're saying. I mean, the, the reality is that when your daughter turns 16, 
and she's uh, in education. If you try and claim universal credit at that point, she's definitely going to be refused because she's in full-time non-advanced education and she's between the ages of 16 and the August after her 19th birthday. So she's someone who is definitely treated as receiving education, definitely going to be refused universal credit. But getting the medical done when she's 16, okay, she'll go through the process. Hopefully um, they will put her through the work capability assessment. They'll accept that she's got a limited capability for work and work-related activity. That won't help her straight away. It won't change the situation initially that she's going to be treated as receiving education. But if things change, so it's, let's say in a year's time or two years time, she moves course and starts a different course of education, then at that point, you would have the option of claiming universal credit for her if you wanted because at that point she would be able to argue that she was exempt from the restrictions because she's a disabled student who had established a limited capability for work before she'd started her new course. Or if she doesn't change courses but just stays in non-advanced education right up until she's 20, once she reaches the September after her 19th birthday, if she was to make a claim for universal credit at that point, having the medical done means that she's not reliant on the discretion of work coaches. She would have a legal right to have no conditions attached to her claim and if there are no conditions attached to her claim then she cannot be refused universal credit as an older student who is in still in full-time non-advanced edu education. Okay, so someone else is asking, we are under tax credits at the moment. Uh, my son's 19. We started, he started college in September 22 in a life skills course. Uh, haven't applied for universal credit yet. <clears throat> so uh, is he likely to get this? Well, he's not likely to get universal credit um, at the moment. He, um, well, actually, yeah, let's just see. He might actually. Um, Okay, so he's 19, so presumably he turned 19 before August. Yeah, so this is going to be complicated. Sorry about this. So if your child um, turned 19 before August and has reached then the August after their 19th birthday, then they're not automatically going to be refused universal credit they may get it. It will depend on whether the DWP staff decide to attach any work-related conditions to their claim and then whether they feel that any conditions that have been attached can be met while he's still on his course. So he can, on he can only be refused if Universal Credit A, decide to apply conditions to his claim looking for training or taking part in training courses or whatever and also in addition to that they believe that he can't get the time off his course to take part in those activities. If they decide not to apply conditions or if they feel that the conditions would be able to be met on his course because his course is quite flexible then he potentially could get universal credit in his own right. That doesn't mean, though, that you necessarily would be wanting to claim universal credit for him just now, because the amount of universal credit that you that he might get is likely to be less or might be less than the amount of tax credits you get for him at the moment, and you can't get both. You can't get tax credits for him if he's claiming universal credit in his own right. So what you need really is a better off calculation done to see for the time being, would you be better off staying on tax credits and child benefit, which you can do up until he turns 20, or would you be better moving on to universal credit now and having the tax credits and child benefits stop? So you, you actually are one of the cases where there's a choice here potentially. Um, 
Yeah, so you would, I would suggest you phone our helpline and what we can do is a, a better off calculation just to see which of the two options is better for you. Um, but yeah, um, you know, if you're still getting tax credits or child benefit for a young person, or if they're, if you're getting universal credit payments for them as a child as part of your universal credit claim, um, before you look at actually making a claim for universal credit, you need to check and make sure that you know you're not going to be worse off if the young person gets universal credit themselves and the payments that you get for them stop. So uh, also a parent here said they're a bit confused. Their child's now 20. Um, they have been, it looks like they've been home educated uh, for a number of years and they're still being home educated. No one has ever told us that we need to have a medical to establish they're unfit to work. So nothing apart from PIP is being claimed. Um, are we now saying it's too late for them to have their uh, ability to work assessed. Well, no, it's not too late. I mean, in, in your case, your child is now 20, so any child benefit, any tax credits, anything like that that you got for them before will have stopped. So there's nothing to be lost by trying to claim universal credit for them. Um, are they likely to be refused universal credit if you claim? Well, they're not in advanced education, presumably. They're not on a course um, where there's a maintenance grant or loan payable. They're potentially still in non-advanced education, although it's been done at home, but they're not of an age where they'd be caught by the rules. So they're not between the ages of 16 and the August after their 19th birthday. So they're not, they're not in one of the groups who will automatically be refused, which means your son should only be refused universal credit if the DWP decide that there's a conflict between the course and any work-related conditions that they uh, apply to the claim. So what I would say is, yeah, make a claim for universal credit for your child. The first decision that universal credit will have to make is, um, do we have any conditions uh, or not? They may decide to switch off the conditions. If they do switch off the conditions, then there'll be no conflict with the claim and he should definitely be uh, allowed to claim universal credit. He shouldn't be restricted as a student. If they decide to have some conditions, then the question is, can he meet those conditions while still taking part in the course? I imagine if the course is happening at home, if it's home education, there'll be a much more flexibility about allowing your son time off to take part in any DWP activities. So in a case like that, I would have thought there'd be a really strong case to argue that your son should be eligible for universal credit despite the fact that you're still home educating him. What will happen is as part of the universal credit claim, you will have to submit fit notes from your doctor. They will organize this work capability assessment as part of the universal credit claim. You don't have to have it done in advance. We're suggesting people do that because it helps and it will speed up the process. But if you haven't managed to get a, uh, a work capability assessment done early, it doesn't stop you from getting one done as part of the universal credit claim. What happens is if you are awarded universal credit for your son, he'll just get the basic rate, what's equivalent to about £57 a week initially. They will then have to be this medical assessment. It could take up to five months, sometimes longer actually, for the assessment to complete. If they agree <clears throat> that your son has a limited capability for work and work-related activity, what they'll then do is they will actually increase the payments to about £131 a week, although it's paid monthly, it's the equivalent, um, and they'll also backdate the extra amount to the fourth month of his claim. So yeah, definitely in that scenario, worth uh, pursuing a universal credit claim for your child. Um, somebody's asking, how many fit notes do we need to hand in? Is it every three months? Well, 
So fit notes are medical certificates from your son or daughter's GP in order to claim universal credit as a disabled person or in order to make a, a credits only claim for ESA to try and get this medical up and running, you do need to submit fit notes from your doctor. It's entirely at your doctor's discretion how long they give a fit note for. So some doctors will give you one for six months or a year or three months. Some doctors might say, well, I'm only willing to do one for a month at a time. There's nothing in the law that dictates that. It's your GPs completely at their own discretion. If your GP is someone that gives you a fit note for a year, you probably won't need another one because by, before that runs out, you'll have had a decision on the medical. But if your um, son or daughter is somebody who uh, sorry, if your GP is somebody who will only give a fit note for a month at a time, you will have to go back and get another one at the end of every month. And you need to keep on having a contemporary fit note until a medical has completed. And once the medical has been completed and the work capability assessment's finished, the Department of Work and Pensions write out to you. They tell you, hopefully, that your son has a limited capability for work. Uh, and work-related activity, and it will specifically say in the letter, you don't need to send us any more fit notes. But until you get that letter, it's really important that your son or daughter has a fit note that's, that's current. And if a fit note runs out or is about to run out, you need to go back to your GP and get another one. And for that reason, it's obviously in your interests um, that the GP gives one for a relatively long time, but the problem is it's, it's down to your GP. No one can force the GP to give a fit note for a longer period than they feel comfortable with. Um, so someone else here is talking about the work capability assessments that happen. And they're saying that a phone call was made asking questions instead of the child being put through a medical. Um, so, yeah, um, the process with these work capability assessments is that um, there will definitely be a questionnaire that you'll be sent out that you need to fill in that asks lots of questions about your child's needs and what they can and can't do. <clears throat> what happens after that varies. For some people, um, a decision might be made just on the paperwork. Uh, for others, there might need to be a consultation with a health professional. Now, before COVID, almost all cases, that meant there was going to be a face-to-face -face consultation, a meeting face-to-face, -face, like what happened used to happen with PIP claims as well. But these days, it's quite rare for a face-to-face -face consultation. What's more likely is that there will be a telephone call made to you and you'll be asked questions over the telephone about your child's needs. So yeah, that sounds to me like that telephone call is part of uh, the DWP having a consultation with a health professional just to be clear about the child's needs before they make a decision about whether or not they accept the child has a limited capability for work. So we've had uh, a query uh, from someone asking, is the um, Facebook Live uh, event being recorded so we can watch it again? Yeah, I should have said that actually. It will be, it is being recorded and it will be posted not only on Facebook, but also on our YouTube uh, pages. Yeah, we understand it's quite a lot of information to take in. Uh, the rules are complicated and, you know, people might want to watch it two or three times just to get their heads around exactly what the rules say, then that's fine. And yeah, uh, we, we hope it will be available as a tool online for other parents who are not being able to attend today as well. Um, also, I should probably say this, we, we do have specific pages on our uh, website, and including a specific page all about claiming universal credit for a young disabled person, which explains all of this stuff in detail, explains about work capability assessments, about making a credits only claim for new style ESA, explains uh, which groups of students are 
caught by the rules and also goes into quite a lot of detail about those older students in non-advanced education who've you know, t turned 20 or at least reached the September after their 19th birthday and the special sort of accept rules that apply to them that mean there's much more flexibility for them to potentially get universal credit despite still being on a course. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so we've got a question here about someone whose daughter's 18 um, and claiming personal independent payment, uh, currently on a vocational distance learning course, being classes in full-time education. Uh, I'm assuming that's non-advanced education. Didn't know about trying to claim universal credit when she was 16. Can we still apply for a work capability assessment at this point? Okay, so yeah, she would never have been able to get universal credit at 16. Um, that's not what we're saying here. What we're saying is at the age of 16, you should try and get the work capability assessment carried out. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be at 16. It could be at any point, 16, 17, 18. The key thing is to try and get it done as early as you can. Okay, there's no specific time scale. You can't get it done before the child's 16, but some point after they turn 16, it's a good idea to try and get a work capability assessment carried out <clears throat> just in case. It might not actually be something you need, but it might. And you don't know in advance. You can't look into the future and be sure. But it will help if your child moves courses at some point in the future, or it will help if they are someone who stays on in full-time non-advanced education for the longer term. It won't hurt in any way. Making a claim for um, New Style ESA won't stop the child benefit or tax credits that you currently get because it won't actually lead to an award. <clears throat> if your child hasn't worked and hasn't paid national insurance, they can't get New Style ESA itself. The only reason you're making the application is to force the medical. And having a medical done does not affect your child benefit or your child tax credit. It's only if your child's awarded a benefit that those can stop. So get the medical done now. It shouldn't affect your current benefits and it might definitely help your son or daughter to claim universal credit at some point in the future. So it's um, a parent here saying, my son turns 19 in, next August. If he continues in non-advanced education, can I continue to claim tax credits for him until he turns 20 in 2024? So yeah, <clears throat> the answer to that question is yes. Um, tax credits and child benefit, they can continue uh, up until the child's 20th birthday, so long as they remain in full-time non-advanced education and as long as they're not claiming or getting universal credit in their own right instead. So yes, you have that option um, of continuing to receive uh, those benefits. Um, obviously, what we'd be saying is, uh, if you think they'll stay in, in non-advanced education after he, he turns 20, then it would be in your interest to try and get a work capability assessment done now because that will make it a lot less likely that he will be refused universal credit at that point. The DWP will not be able to argue there's a conflict between his course and his universal credit claim if he's someone who's already established that he has a limited capability for work and work-related activity. Okay, so... Um, Unfortunately, we've kind of run out of time. Again, I just apologize for the delay at the beginning this morning. Uh, it was due to technical reasons beyond our control. Um, as I said earlier, today's Facebook Live session will be um, put, put back up on Facebook, a recording of it, and also will be on our YouTube channel. Um, what I'll also do is I'll have a look through um, uh, all the comments we did have a large number of comments i've not been able to actually uh, directly deal with all of them this morning 
But what I'll do is I'll have a look through all the comments we received. If there's things that I didn't cover in today's session, then we'll post um, so a new story on our website, um, sort, of wrap, uh, sort of wrapping up all of the issues that came up that perhaps weren't fully addressed, uh, just so people have you know clear advice about um, their, the situation that they're in. So um, listen, guys, um, thanks so much for taking part in today's session. Uh, apologies if I didn't get around to answering your question directly. Um, yeah, but we'll try and go through them. We'll try and make sure that um, responses are uh, put up. And obviously, if you want to talk about your child's case in much more detail, if it's particularly complicated, if you don't understand uh, what's happening in their particular case, you can also phone our helpline. Uh, we provide advice on all aspects of claiming benefits and tax credits and certainly one of the common issues we've dealt with over the last year and a half have been queries about universal credit for young disabled people. So yeah, thanks so much for taking part today. We really appreciate it and um, yeah, um, good luck and um, have a good day. Okay, bye.